Welcome back to Decouple. Today, I am joined by fan favorite returning guest, uh, Mr. James Krellenstein. And we have a very exciting show for you today. We will be chatting. Um, I think the episode title is going to be The Perfect Storm of Vogel. But I think we're going to chat much more broadly. And the way I'd like to lean into this, again, a bit of an analysis of, of what went wrong at Vogel, is by positioning ourselves in this moment where we're talking so much about a nuclear revival where the word renaissance is a little bit taboo because it was thrown around a lot in the early 2000s james i want to like time travel with you to the early 2000s when all the planning was going on for the rollout of of the uh this brand new beautiful reactor the ap1000 um in america in china and i want to get a sense from you that if you if you were um you know your age now um and you're in that time do you think you could have foreseen how things went, how things fizzled in that renaissance, the troubles we had with, I think, what you consider to be the world's greatest reactor um, and and just <laughs> how badly the rollout went? Because I am I am a diagnosed, uh, uh, what is it again? It's a defensive pessimist. Uh, Doomberg, uh, there's a great clinician, gave me that um, that diagnosis. It, it, it Because of my Eastern European background, I'm half Ukrainian. That country has just been rolled by you know, one civilization or another in our entire existence. So it's like baked into my genetics and those of a lot of my Eastern European brethren to always, <laughs> always assume the worst and then occasionally to be pleasantly surprised when something not so bad happens. So I, I think part of what makes me an effective nuclear advocate is that I am constantly being pessimistic and that forces me into a real sort of triage based analysis of what's the lowest risk thing we can do. And that guides a lot of my strategic insights and activism. I'm going on a little you bit know, of a sidetrack, but but yeah, if we can <laughs> if we can if we can jump back to those early 2000s and imagine ourselves, you know, in our current realities, in our current personalities, with everything we know, um, back in those heady days, I think when there's a lot of enthusiasm, would you have seen it coming? Um, let's just have a little thought experiment. So here's here's a question that you know I'm also a pessimist because you know the good thing about being a pessimist is on one hand, if the worst happens, at least you're right. And then if the good thing happens, you're wrong, but the good thing happens. So either way you win, yeah. right, psychologically. So I um, totally agree on, on being a pessimist. But but maybe uh, like most pessimists, I like to couch my pessimism, pessimism in, you know, saying it's a realist. But, you know, I think we should be really, really clear here that, um, you know, the AP1000 projects were not the only projects that we star, uh, saw getting started here. Remember, the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission has issued combined operating licenses for over 17 gigawatts of new uh, nuclear power plants in the United States starting from the mid-2000s onward, right? Um, we only saw, you know, about 2.2, 2.4 gigawatts of those actually ever come to completion, which of course is Vogel 3 and 4. But it wasn't just the AP1000, it wasn't just Westinghouse, and it wasn't just... Um, you know, these two sites at Vogel and Summer. Instead, it was multiple reactor vendors. Remember, we had this whole consortium of 10 U.S. utilities with GEH, with their economically simplified boiling water reactor, the ESPWR, come together with Westinghouse with DOE money to basically, with U.S. government taxpayer money, to form New Start, which was a consortium that would help fund and do technical collaboration on all of these different reactor uh, sort of new new starts using the new NRC licensing procedure, which was Part 52, which is the one-step licensing rather than the two-step licensing or Part 50. So your initial question, which I sort of, you know, to give it a little background on, would I have I foreseen these challenges coming? I'm not so sure. One of the interesting things is I'm not so sure, even though I love the AP1000, I'm not sure that's the reactor I would have built if it was 2005, 2006. The reason is it had never been built before. Even in China, right, which we were just beginning to gear up that build, it just hadn't been. And what I wish I could go back, you know, in 2005, I was 14 years old. And actually, I was following this, uh, oddly, of course but, you but in a much more sort of uh, less professional sort of, you know, middle school procrastinating on my homework sort of way. Um, and the, the, the question I would always ask them is, okay, so you, you just built the advanced boiling water reactor, the ABWR, which is a GE Hitachi Toshiba product, actually. It's all three of them that, that got together. And we just built two of the first-of-a-kind reactors in Japan, and they were one of the fastest builds in nuclear build history, I think, ever, 
right? Um, they were, you know, from, from nuclear construction start to commercial operation, it was under 40 months, right? And it was under budget as well. And the ABWR was already licensed in the United States. In fact, the Advanced Boiling Water Reactor was the first nuclear steam supply system and standardized plant design to actually receive a Part 52 design certification. And the first to get a rulemaking. So in the design certification process, the NRC literally makes a rule and codifies it in the Code of Federal Regulations. So they can't, they themselves can't wiggle with the regulatory things. That's 10 CFR 52 Appendix A, which is the ABWR rule. That was in 97. The design cert comes in 94. So here we have the ABWR, this like, it just hit it out of the park Right. Um, And then the Japanese are building four or five more, which means we've got a hot running supply chain. Right. We've got Hitachi Works. Right. Really building those modular modules out. Excuse me. And almost no one, with the exception of two sites. Right. We did actually issue two COLs, two combined operating licenses for ABWR at South at South Texas Project Unit three and Unit four, which don't exist. But there was a license, a full COL issued for the ABWR. But besides that, it's just basically the ESBWR, the AP1000, um, none of which had been built before. And believe it or not, there's a lot of interest in the EPR. Uh, we had multiple sites in the process of getting what was called, rather than the European pressurized reactor, the evolutionary power reactor. But it was the same EPR uh, that did so well at OL3 in Flamanville. Um, that was being evaluated for sites like Bell Bend, you know, next to um, Susquehanna Units 1 and 2 in, in Pennsylvania, Nine Mile Point Unit Number 3 up in uh, uh, upstate New York, um, and, you know, even stuff like Calvert Cliffs. And so we had actually a bunch of different reactors being evaluated by the industry and actually going through and having hundreds of millions of dollars per site being, you know, running through the licensing process. And we had a concerted effort. And the thing that that strikes me then and strikes me now is we kept on doing, we keep on doing the same thing, which is we keep on building an unbuilt reactor. Thinking, I think as we've talked about ad nauseum and your fans, no doubt listeners are are sick of hearing me saying this, thinking that these new designs will just fix everything that has ever happened, where we've left on the sort of, uh, on the mat, the ABWR, and now I feel like we're doing it with the AP1000 as well. So I see that continuity happening. I'm not so sure I could have predicted all of the the real challenges that we saw with the AP1000 construction, um, once again, I was a teenager. Um, But it it does, there's one common lesson that I see, which is that the industry and utilities started to elect uh, a reactor design based on, you know, a lot of the paper advantages of this reactor design, rather than going with a design that they could have gone with, which was the ABWR. Right, right. You know, it's interesting in terms of the the perspective I have on nuclear. It's, you know, in terms of my 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 personal experience and the time I've spent really delving into this, that's only five years. Um, you know, I've been doing a little more reading around the early days of, say, the Canadian nuclear program and, and getting a, a broader sort of historical perspective from talking with folks like yourself. Um, but you know, it really does seem like five years ago when I started, these were some of the darkest days for nuclear, um, Fukushima had happened. There was still some inertia of, you know, some nuclear activity that was ongoing from this early Renaissance and what the British, you know, refer to as the, you know, 2000 to 2010. I love it. They call it the naughties because not means zero there. But so during this period of the naughties, <laughs> um, you know, there was enough momentum going, even if a lot of the projects fizzled or, or were um, going well behind budget, they were, they'd still been started and there was enough um, path dependency that they survived Fukushima. And so I'd argue even right after Fukushima, nuclear was in a better place. And then we hit this real sort of hangover um, you know, with with the failures on, to construct on budget on time with the EPRs and AP1000s that were really dark days, I'd say, when, when I got into this 2017, 2018. And so the delta between that low point that I'm perceiving at the beginning of my nuclear advocacy career to now, it feels exhilarating. That being said, this is kind of sad compared to, I think, where we were at in the noughties with tons of, you know, licensing uh, procedures happening with uh, lots of projects going ahead. Yes, making the exact same era that we're seeing now of whatever exists at the moment that we've even just recently built state of the art reactors like ABWR is not good enough. We're going to move on now. Um, it, it, it's an interesting parallel, but I'm just, again, reflecting on, uh, you know, 
what how, how amazing those naughties were. I think both of you, you and I would be incredibly excited if there were, you know, 17 sites being prepped in the US, multiple technologies being considered. Uh, we probably would have had some of the same criticisms. But anyway, just just a little footnote and, and, uh, and thing of interest. Well, I think, you know, I think we should, we should note that a huge part of this, especially in the United States was, you know, natural gas. Uh, I mean, there's, there's just nuclear was much more of a straightforward economic case um, in the, the early, not in the noughties, I guess, to adopt that term, but in the, the mid 2000s, because you know, if you look at just like Henry hub price, right. It was like at like, you know, it, it peaked at $15 before the financial crisis in $2,000 per mm BTU. Now it's at like $3 and, you know, slightly below that uh, per mm BTU. So the, the economic case for having nuclear generation on the grid was just in the United States was far more, um, uh, attractive, just straight up uh, in that period than it is today, you know, prior to the fracking revolution, right? That really just dramatically transformed for North America and the United States in particular are what what was attractive as baseload or baseload capable generation. And, um, you know, I, I also want to just point out that one of the more interesting th things that we are seeing now, I think, is that we had utilities really, really working to build nuclear um, and were eager customers. I would argue some of them today are still eager customers. The thing that happened was we should not understate as much as I am a, apparently being known as an AP 1000 fanboy, the disaster that was at Summer and Vogel. We should not... Um, underplay it. And one of the things that when I first re-entered into this space in a more professional capacity, the thing that shocked me was about how little people talked about it in a rigorous way and how much, you know, the industry and advocates seem to have created some really nice fairy tales about uh, what happened there um, and why it ultimately wasn't the industry's fault. It was everyone else's fault. But I think if you actually go down and, and study this, one, it's a just a treasure trove of lessons learned that are invaluable, that every person, in my opinion, you know, who is considering getting into nuclear, wants to do something new nuclear, should study, should learn. We spent, my company, we spent two years working through every piece of paper that uh, is available on this. And one of the, you know, one of the bad things about the AP 1000 situation at, at summer in particular was it devolved into a lot of litigation, which obviously is never good. One of the upsides of that, uh, if we can call it that, was is that some of the stuff that you would never see that are hidden behind utility file cabinets and vaults and in Westinghouse's vaults and CB&I's vault, some of that's now seen the light of day. And it's in public and we can read sort of the real time correspondence going back and forth between, you know, the different project participants sort of documenting this, this disaster as it unfolds. And, and I, I think that gives us a real, you know, objective view of what was going on, at least from the point of view of the project participants. The other thing I'll just say, though, is we need to be honest about this and we need to understand that if it, you know, in, in my humble opinion, one of the biggest things that is keeping back nuclear today is what happened at Vogel and Summer. And the solution cannot be just not to not talk about it. It must be that we are willing to talk about it, confront it, and be honest about what happened and why we are taking steps so it will never happen. Right, right. So, you know, I can't think of anyone better to have on then to talk about this since, you know, your company has been deep diving this and trying to learn those lessons. Um, but again, I'm, again, I'm just fascinated with the naughties and, and uh, with this historical period. So let's talk a little bit about this before we get into what went wrong at Vogel, what went wrong at Summer, maybe sure. even what went wrong um, at Zanmen. I'm, I'm blanking on the Chinese sites right now. Zanmen and Haiyang. Ooh, I'm kind of impressed with myself for remembering Zanmen. Um, but anyway, um, before we get there, like we live in a radically different time. I mean, this is just this, this for me, this is fascinating, this comparison across 20 years. Um, globalization was really heading, it was its heydays. Um, China had opened up. Um, the, the idea at that point that, um, you know, we'd get China to do the first few reactors, 
that they would build up a supply chain, that there was such kind of openness, I think, in that relationship, even over something as as geopolitical and strategic and, and I don't want to say tactical as nuclear, but like, what was the vision there? Because again, transporting myself to that period, I'd be like, this is awesome, guys. This sounds like a great plan. Um, tell me a little bit more about, you know, and, and maybe we can confine this, you know, in terms of we're talking nuclear renaissance, but we are going to get into Vogel summer. So let's kind of stay with the AP 1000 thing. What was that sort of nice, peachy globalization vision of the AP 1000 deployment? Well, it wasn't just, you know, I know we want, we want to confide to the AP 1000, but we should be clear, right? Sure. You know, China was built, had a very audacious and still has a very audacious nuclear um, um, power plant and nuclear energy, you know, development program. They're building dozens of reactors today. No one else is uh, in that scale. And it wasn't just the AP 1000 who tried to build the first, you know, the first two EPRs course, we're in, are in China, right? Um, as you may know, your, your Can Do 6, even before this, in the 1990s, was built also in China, right? Um, and we had a real, and, and the Russians were building VVERs and still are building VVERs in China as well. So we had a huge amount of, you know, people say China's a hot market. They're looking to build initially Western technology. And what a better place um, that has a really established construction workforce. You know, we built, they build stuff in China a lot. Um, as someone who's been to China before, it is just impressive. Um, and they, they have now probably the world's most experienced workforce in nuclear power plant construction and the safety and welding characteristics uh, that are necessary. There's also an impression that the Chinese... Um, you know, regulator, well, it's, it's, you definitely can't blame the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, for what goes wrong in a build in China. Uh, they don't have an NRC. They do have, a, actually, I would argue, a pretty competent regulator themselves. But regardless, there's a perception, how, how real it is, that the regulatory burden is much less. Um, and we, we see this even play out a little bit with the AP1000 build. But just to go back, and one of the things is also just to go to your initial point, in that initial AP1000 build out, that, that Westinghouse gets in, in China, they agree to transfer the intellectual property really in a way to China. And actually that's what we see now with the six reactors that are now coming in that are being built that are AP 1000 derivatives, quote unquote, uh, how much their derivatives is a different question. They're called CAP, Chinese AP 1000, CAP 1000. And even kind of worse than this, if I was uh, Westinghouse's IP council, what I would sort of, shake my head or, cry, you know, is was the decision that apparently, and I've only gotten this on sort of secondhand information, is, is that, you know, the Chinese have also upscaled the AP-1000 to a much bigger reactor that's over 1,500 megawatts called the CAP-1400, the CAP-1400, which is a scaled up version. My understanding is that Westinghouse does not have the back licensing rights, essentially, to that larger scaled up uh, AP-1000, uh, the AP-1400 or CAP-1400. So we're in a situation where we kind of transferred the, the crown jewels over to China, maybe under sort of a, a different sort of uh, time that was maybe a little bit too starry eyed about the Chinese sort of, you know, Bush two days uh, about China being a partner. But um, I'm not so sure in hindsight, as you noted, it looks it looks good at all. And I want to I want to drill down on Sanmen because I think that uh, and pronounce and forgive me if I'm. My, Chinese, my Mandarin pronunciation is not good. It is not. Um, but, you know, the Sanmen build was the first clue I had that the story that often the U.S. nuclear advocates that I had initially, and even some initial industry people that I had spoken to about what went wrong with the AP-1000 wasn't right, right? That there was something far, far deeper to this story um, than what has been told. Um, and I think that's a really instructive point to start. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the Chinese builds, I understand base mats are being poured, I think in, in 2009. So they got a head start, uh, summer and Vogel, I think it's like 2012, 2013. So what kind of information is, is coming into the, the U S constructors from China as, as they proceed? What are some of the frustrations? What, uh, we don't have time, I think, to go into it in depth in terms yeah. of what went wrong in China when it came to AP-1000 deployment. But maybe just from a you know a, a thirty thousand foot view, give me give me a sense well, so of, of how that things, went. Maybe on a thirty thousand foot view, we have to realize one of the things that happens right in this process uh, in two thousand nine, actually, exactly, is in the United States, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission 
finalizes a rule saying that new nuclear power plants um, must, uh, new constructed nuclear power plants must be able to withstand an aircraft impact uh, and be able to protect the core um, uh, in the event of that uh, occurrence. It's called the AIA, the Aircraft Impact Assessment, 10 CFR 5150. And what and the, because none of the AP1000 sites had yet been actually licensed, every new AP1000 was required to now comply with that, right? So this required Westinghouse, even though Westinghouse had been warned a couple of years before that this was coming down, Westinghouse was apparently quite unprepared and really has to start redesigning everything. And we use in, in a standardized construction process, like what the AP1000 is using, using this one-step process, we have some little design control document, which as its name implies, controls the design um, and has parameters. And so we jump from revision 15 of the DCD, actually revision 16 of the DCD, to revision 18 and 19. And we redesign the entire shield building uh, that surrounds the containment building of the AP1000. Um, the Chinese did not have this um, uh, rule change. So they start building on revision 15, right, uh, where they really start building uh, a classical reinforced concrete uh, shield building. So we start an initial divergence right there. Now. A lot of U.S. nuclear advocates often say it was all the NRC's part. Rod Adams, I believe, published a piece in 2014 or something saying that the root cause of the delays at Vogel were, and Summer, were due to this AIA rule. And I don't think there's really much empirical support for that. The AIA rule, of course, was a challenge. But let me just l let us start at this point. Sanmen unit number one, which is being built in China. Right, which is not subject to the US NRC, not subject to the aircraft impact assessment rule, and has a workforce that is extremely experienced, you know, accessible, craft labor for workforce in nuclear construction. It is the single to, to this day, it took the longest of any nuclear power plant ever constructed in China. It takes more than double the median length of construction duration that happened, uh, uh, that, that was happening in China in the modern LWR build out that we see. China, it took over nine years from base map to operation, right? We see today a median build, which is exceptional, of 4.5 years around that in China. Um, and globally, we actually see a median of around six years with China really bringing us down on that median. So, we're, so you can't, so my initial, when I sort of started hearing this and I sort of read this and did the math, uh, the time math on China, I said, this doesn't make sense. It can't be the aircraft impact assessment rule because the aircraft impact assessment rule doesn't apply to China. It can't be the NRC because the Chinese don't have the NRC. And it can't just be that they don't have an experienced workforce because the Chinese have an experienced workforce. We had this like, great case control experiment. Like we had one where we were building in the United States, one building in China. And like the, the Chinese were slightly faster, but actually not that much faster, believe it or not, uh, than, than the American build. And it really points to actually, in my mind, and what I think there's much more empirical support for what was going on in this build. And the, which was that we just mismanage Westinghouse and their initial EPC partners, which was Shaw, which had bought the Old Stone and Webster. Right, had just completely, I'm just going to say it absolutely frankly, mismanaged this to a degree that is um, painful to analyze in hindsight. And I know this is all very funny because I, I, I'm the one who's saying we should build another AP-1000. It's the first thing we should do. But it's because I believe that actually by telling the real story, not the sort of nuclear bro uh, nuke bro sort of fairy tale that we often tell ourselves. Actually, the argument for building another AP-1000 is much stronger than what the nuke bro fairy tale is uh, about how everyone was persecuting us and, and just was, you know, we can't catch a break. Um, so, so I think that's a really good place to start and a really interesting sort of note to, to begin. Absolutely. And, you know, I always, before I record an episode like this, we did do an episode with Mark Nelson probably two years ago titled what went wrong at nuclear so we'll have a different title for this one um but you know to me uh, you know obviously being far less educated on these topics um you know there's a couple of variables in that case control study um and i think we're going to get into some of those details for me and and kind of the impression i got from that interview is there's just something wrong with this design it's it's too cramped 
Uh, it's too difficult to work around in. Um, certainly, that's one potential variable. But I think you know we're going to have a different perspective here today, and I'm I'm really looking forward to that. But before these kind of interviews, I always go back and I watch AP 1000 promotional videos from the noughties. Um, and just as a historical record and a document, and you know what's promised is you know rapid construction times, eliminating construction risk, and I think that was the genesis of the AP 1000 in the AP 600. When I guess in the 80s and 90s there was a thought of you know it seems like we kind of have these ideas of let's go really big, let's come down a little bit, let's go big again, let's go really small modular. That's kind of been the thing in the last <laughs> cent. Now we're coming back to maybe gigawatt scale, but the promise of the AP 600 and later the AP 1000 was it was going to be so constructible. And and we talk about yes. this. We've referenced that MIT study, nuclear steam supply system is like 20% of overnight capital costs. Um, it's all about buildability. We need innovation and construction, construction, construction. That's what the promise was. Why was the promise not delivered in China and, and Vogel? And whenever you're ready, if you want to keep talking a bit about China or jump over to Vogel in summer, I'll leave it up to you. Well, so I think, I think well, we should first of all dispute, disabuse this idea that it's too cramped. Right. The AP-1000, it is true, has a smaller containment vessel than a comparable pressurized water reactor, um, maybe on the order actually of uh, maybe a little bit smaller than the ice condenser PWRs like at Waspar and Sequoia and McGuire and Catawba, like uh, which have a ice based pressure suppression system. But, you know. Look, when I think small containments, the AP-1000 is, you know, downright luxurious uh, in, in its uh, containment size compared to what a boiling water reactor containment looks like, maybe with the exception of the Mark III BWR containment. Like, but if you look at what a Mark I boiling water reactor containment is, like a Browns Ferry or Vermont Yankee or Fukushima Daiichi, right, those um, containments, right, are really, really cramped. Um, and you can't even go inside them when during operation. Same thing with the Mark II because they're nitrogen you know, they're nitrogen inerted. So it is not that that it's too cramped or that this design is bad. It's actually, I would argue, the AP-1000 is still a fantastically constructible reactor and really was designed at the top level with constructability in mind. And the first thing to really recognize is the AP-1000 is the first modular, well, the AP-600 really was, the first fully modularized a nuclear island that we've ever seen. And as you may recall, right, the AP-1000 consists of 342 modules. So that's 122 structural modules, 154 piping modules, 55 mechanical equipment modules, and 11 electrical equipment modules. And the idea of this was something that you hear, I don't know, I could go next week to a nuclear conference and hear this exact shtick, which is, if we can bring in so much of that nuclear island and nuclear grade fabrication tasks out of the field into a centralized factory, we can reduce the cost, increase quality, increase, um, you know, repeatability and increase economies of scale. And the, the guys in, in, in Pittsburgh really took this ethos and took it to its, you know, kind of uber maximum sort of state and actually tried to build a reactor based on that ideology, on, on that on that methodology. That's, I think, still a very good idea. But as we um, we saw in Sanmen, Haiyang, Vogel, and Summer, it's not the only story. It's not the only thing you need. And the first thing that you're going to need to know, and it's kind of the logical next step, okay, so we have all these modules, fantastic, right? That's how we're going to build the plan. Um, and we should just be be clear, like what this modules mean, right? So I'm going to look at three different modules. Let's talk about three different modules, or actually let's talk about two different modules right now, right? So like the famous one probably that everyone, well, I don't know, everyone, that's probably no one, but actually people who have followed the story know is the CA20 module or CA20, which is basically in the auxiliary building and has the spent fuel pool, and stuff, and it's it's literally it is so massive. It's nine hundred and five metric tons, right? Um, it is sixty seven feet by forty seven feet by sixty nine feet. So that's like twenty one meters by fourteen meters by twenty one meters, right? And as I said, it weighs close to a thousand metric tons, nine hundred and five metric tons. So obviously, you can't actually transport that entire module. So what do you do? You break it up into sub-modules, in the case of CA-2072, sub-modules that you bring to the site and then you assemble at the site outside of the construction site in what's called a module assembly building, have that entire sort of CA-20 building, uh, you know, sort of module sort of assembled on site and then 
moved over into the nuclear island. Okay, great. That's still a great approach, right? We're still breaking down like, um, you know, it's like the Legos that you see on the, um, you know, these, these SMR videos, right? We're just snap it together and it will be all, you know, glorious. The, the problem right away that we see is two things that, that, that ultimately doom this. Well, not doom it. Obviously, we finished it, but really cause a major problem. The first is, is who's going to build those modules, right? So we have Shaw, which was, a, you know, a famous new, a Louisiana company that's famous in the oil and gas industry, really for pipe, you know, for piping and piping manufacturing. And Shaw buys an old, veritable uh, nuclear EPC, Stone and Webster, out of Boston. They integrate it in, and then they create a module factory down in Lake Charles, Louisiana. And we initially uh, start seeing some initial warning signs, right? Um, and the first thing is that the first warning sign that I always like to talk about was back in 2011. So about a year before we really start nuclear island construction at Vogel and Summer, right? The NRC goes down to this Lake Charles fa module factory in January of 2011 saying, you know, it's less than a year away from construction start, we, we, we assume module fabrication is beginning. We want to inspect to make sure that the safety culture is right, that the QA, QC processes, et cetera, everything is going well. So the NRC does a su surprise inspection on January 10th of 2011. And what does the NRC find? Well, the NRC leaves the next day. Why do they leave the next day? Because they note that there isn't enough activity going on at the site, they haven't actually started building enough modules to even inspect anything. Literally, the NRC says like, hey guys, call me when you're ready to act, when you're actually doing something. And that way I'll surprise inspect you then because we have nothing to inspect here, right? Um, and that's the initial, one of the initial warning signs that this module assembly building down in Lake Charles ain't going so well, right? And it is really with nuclear construction, you you know, um, you know, no matter how early you start, you're already late is, is the old joke that I always hear. And this really will turn out to become one of the Achilles heel of the AP-1000. That Achilles heel is if you don't have a good supply chain, the advantage of modular construction becomes a dramatic disadvantage. And we'll start seeing this cascade throughout the entire AP-1000 build. Now, in CB&I's defense, we'll get back to Lake Charles in one second. One of the reasons why construction was so, why module assembly and fabrication was so behind was because Westinghouse had not completed many of the design, uh, the, the, the design finality on many of the modules architecture. Right. And it was not ready. It was not certified for procurement or construction. And we will see this continuous problem as we walk through the project sort of begin dooming it. Um, and that really is a major, major lesson that everyone here uh, has to, uh, in my mind, should take from this is that whatever level of design completion you're at, unless you have a reference operating plant, you're probably not design complete. And we will start seeing that by 2015, 2016, there is still major engineering changes going on in the module uh, sort of architecture. In one case, even about four or five years after module fabric, after the plant had been nuclear island construction, um, we start seeing that there is, in some cases, a thousand design changes per month being communicated from Westinghouse in Pittsburgh all the way down to the suppliers. Right. Which, you know, we can blame the suppliers and the suppliers were not prepared. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But ultimately, the suppliers were put into a very hard position because Westinghouse itself uh, wasn't actually prepared. And actually, I think, has had misled consortium members, including the utilities that were ordering them, about what the level of design completion was at the beginning of the project. And that's a really major error. And this is going to cause... In addition to the supply chain errors, this will cause the major regulatory problem that we see as well in this construction. But I want to pause and, uh, and, and you know, stop ranting. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So <clears throat> one little uh, kind of thematic uh, 
bit for me and then another question, but they're, they're all they're all related. Um, so first off, I mean, again, having been in this space for five years, um, small modular reactors, modularity, uh, I think, is often framed and and received by policymakers, politicians, those coming to nuclear as this like brand new concept that is specific to SMRs. And again, I hear it over and over again from people who uh, are very well meaning. Um, this concept, you know, a journalist friend of mine in Alberta who was talking about SMRs recently and this idea, you build it in a factory and you just bring it over and plug it into the grid. And, you know, I think maybe it's because we're thinking so much about wind and solar where, yeah, you can essentially build, you know, several components um, or, you know, the panels themselves and just put them down and plug them in. I, I still disagree with Jigger Shaw who you know, said I had my head screwed on the wrong way. I'm, I'm taking a bit of a low blow here that a nuclear construction project is a little more difficult than a wind and solar construction project. But all that to be said, I mean, this modularity thing is fascinating. We're talking about um, this, con- this case control trial we have of the Chinese uh, project happening slightly in advance, but somewhat in parallel to those in the U.S. I imagine they're a little bit better at, at making modules. So can we eliminate that as, as a potential cause in terms of, um, some, of some of the differences or, or, or design specific flaws? Well, so I think that once again, the problem was, is that anyone can be, you can be the best modular fabricator in the world, but if the, um, the sort of, if the design controllers, if the designers of those modules aren't done with the design, it doesn't matter how good you are at module fabrication, you're not going to be able to do this, right? And that's really what we saw a lot in the Chinese situation is, is that they were ready to build these modules, right? They even built dedicated factories that are still running that will be building the cap. 1000s but one of the major problem you know contributors to this delay was the fact that the engineering debt was so significant at 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 uh on the AP1000 that it it forestalled uh effective um module fabrication or or efficient module fabrication and just to give you an idea i'm not i'm not joking here about what this what this looked like so if you go back into the timeline even before nuclear construction started right um you know westinghouse reported back in March 17, 2011, that 90.49% of all of the issued for construction blueprints were issued, right? That they were essentially ready to be built, right? And then just a couple months later in May, Westinghouse reports to the Department of Energy that, it's, that, that they are 95% done with issued for completion. Now, I'm not going to go through everything. Let's fast forward two years to March 31st, 2014. All of a sudden, Westinghouse is reporting, actually, I know we said 95% back in 2011 uh, were issued for construction. Actually, now, it turns out only 88% of the drawings are, are certified issued for construction, which gives you an idea of the total lack of process control that was beginning down at Westinghouse. That they had either been, they either did not know, that's obviously not the right number, right? As time goes on, if you're saying 90% are done in 2011, then 95% are done in 2011. And then all of a sudden, years later, you're reporting to your customers, well, actually only 88% are done. Something is wrong here. And that is a major theme that we'll see throughout this build. That not only was the design actually not done um, and really didn't finish in the case of Vogel until like 2016, 2017. But Westinghouse and CB&I and the EPC are kind of themselves not sure about how much engineering debt they have on this project, which shows, I think, a complete lack of project management, to use a, a euphemism here. Um, and that's a very kind euphemism. In some cases, I would say this is not way, the way you should should talk about your um, to, to talk to your customers in an integrated project delivery framework. There's one more thing I want to flag here. One of the strengths that we saw the NRC evolve in was a major problem, even before the Nuclear Regulatory Commission existed, even before uh, Three Mile Island happened, right? One of the major problems that we had in U.S. nuclear licensing was this two-step licensing process where you get a construction permit to start building, you start building, and then 
you would apply mid bill for an operating license. And the problem, of course, is, is that that's the, oh, the first time that you're really putting your final design in front of the regulator. And the regulator can say, oh, I'm sorry that you constructed, you know, that emergency core cool, that high pressure coolant injection pump in this way. Sorry, that's not actually compliant. You're going to need to rebuild, ratchet down, retrofit, destroy everything you had built. And this was a major problem. Even with the AEC, we saw on the Sequoia nuclear project back in 73, 74, 30 major subsystems have to be redesigned mid-construction after they had already been built because of this two-step licensing procedure. So the NRC introduces this new procedure called Part 52, which is basically says, no, 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 we're going to license the entire plant before you start construction. The whole idea is, and then you'll have tests that you will define that shows that you built it in compliance with the licensing basis. And that way, you can't ratchet mid-build. You know from the very beginning, before you pour a drop of concrete or place an ounce of rebar, what exactly you need to do to get the regulator happy. Here's the problem. The NRC held its end of the bargain. They did not change, after the issuance of that license, a single rule or a single regulation. The problem was, let's go back to this lack of design maturity that we have. The bargain that you're making with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is that you know your design backwards and forwards, and you know how to construct it ultimately. But because so much of the Westinghouse AP1000 design had actually not been actually finished, okay, it meant that in reality, in or they had to issue many, many amendments to this license because simply put, they couldn't actually build that what their own license that they had submitted to the NRC uh, said because the, the design wasn't done, right? So this will lead to, on Vogel 3, 188, now it's actually a little bit more than that, license amendments that have to go through the NRC mid-construction, not because the NRC is changing anything, but because the license that actually, you know, the licensee and Westinghouse and CB9 initially put together wasn't buildable. And wasn't going to conform to the actual design that was going to be built because that design wasn't done when the licensing was finished. So we see this part, the advantage of the part 52 process, once again, like the modular modularity, become a disadvantage, right? Because it turned out that the design wasn't done. And in the in Georgia Power and in you know now defunct Scana's defense. Westinghouse itself seemed to be not so either not able or not willing to tell their customers the level of design maturity that they actually had on that design, which I think ultimately influenced the um, you know licensing pathway that was taken. So in terms of summarizing so far, I understand more factors will come up. We haven't talked about um, some of the kind of litigation issues. Uh, we certainly inferred um, some of the atrophy of, the, of supply chain and, and project management. Um, we haven't talked about things like COVID or, or kind of worker retention. Um, sure. But, but if for now, and can you just summarize like the, the two or three key things uh, in, in terms of your thesis, uh, j- just so we ha- give our listeners a, a place to sort of toggle their thoughts? So the first thing is modular, you know, AP1000 is a highly modular plant, 342 modules, Right. But that is dependent on a modular supply chain that is working, that is ready to go. Um, That modular supply chain was not ready to go. And the the primary supplier of many of these modules, which was Shaw's, uh, uh, you know, Shaw's factory in Lake Charles, had no nuclear culture, had never built a nuclear project before, um, was all from the oil and gas industry, which is a very different safety and regulatory culture. So that's number one. A corollary to the modular supply chain not being ready was is that, and this would be a systemic issue, is that the design wasn't ready. The design was not finalized for the AP1000 in what we call issued for construction ready, right? Like that, that actually we have blueprints and drawings and work packages that are ready to go down to a work team um, and go to a work face and begin building that. Um, that was not ready. And that impacted both the actual on-site uh, construction of both Vogel and Summer, but it also impacted the ability of the modular modular suppliers to actually build the modules because it turned out that the module architecture was not ready, it was not issued for construction or procurement either, right? So we have literally cases of modules being built and they have to be rebuilt at the factory because of the design instability. 
the 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 and this also causes a major regulatory headache, right? That because the NRC, the license that Westinghouse and and the utilities submitted to the NRC, right, was based on a design that turned out not to be complete. As they finished the design and up and actually tried to build it, it turned out they had to do a huge amount of change and go back before the re- to the regulator to actually change the design and get a regulatory approval for them. So j- just a question here again, uh, in terms of, it, it sounds like there was an effort certain to localize supply chain to this uh, Lake Charles facility and not necessarily leverage uh, the Chinese supply chain. And we've talked about the different contexts of globalization that we were in then and now. Um, were there any efforts to like maybe after the Ch- Charles Lake or Lake Charles facility was proving to be inept to try and harness? Um, you, you mentioned that the Chinese had built up specific factories to build these modules. Like, was it a happier, friendlier globalization period in which that was an option? Was it the need to sort of show local economic development uh, statistics that kept them working in the U.S. sector? And and even looking into the future, I mean, is there are there plans to leverage that Chinese now cap supply chain to make AP one thousand more viable, uh, you know, in future builds in the U.S. and Poland? It's way too big of a question, but I just can't help myself asking it. Yeah, so I I'm actually not sure about during the mid build if there were any you know decisions to use the AP one thousand uh, design uh, the sort of Chinese supply chain. Um, I, I think there might be regulatory issues about how they were certified, you know, whether they had end stamps or not had end stamps, although I believe they were actually end stamped. But, uh, you know, I think uh, I, I don't think that ended up happening at all. And you can actually see what happens in the middle of the um, uh, the middle of the build. What begins happening is we start moving away from, uh, you know, Lake Charles to other factory, you know, fabricators around. Um, the country um, to basically begin fabricating um, these uh, modules, submodules, right? And not only that, we should be clear, it's not just the United States, right? We were, there was major fabrication activities going on in Italy at the time. Uh, For example, South Korea was, you know, fabricating the steam steam generators, the, uh, the reactor pressure vessels at Doosan, right? So this was not, this was a globalized supply chain. I'm not so sure we had very much Chinese involvement, which is curious. Um, but I, my understanding is now it is viewed that the ability to use that Chinese supply chain, unfortunately, for geostrategic reasons, um, is not uh, a viable option. So we, we do have this challenge ahead of us of building a viable AP1000 supply chain uh, here in the United States or in a, among our allies, right? You know, and also Toshiba began actually themselves fabricating, which was a, a uh, um, uh, 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 the then owner of Westinghouse was also beginning, for example, on CA01 module was doing a lot of the sub-module fabrication. Same thing with the IHI in, in Japan. So it was a international um, fabrication, you know, supply chain, but it, it, it was not, it was a little bit haphazard, right? So if you look back at, back to CA20, for example, Right, that big module that I was talking about that's nearly a thousand metric tons for summer unit number three. Right, what we saw is that 13 of the 72 submodules were not going to be fabricated actually by this point in um, uh, um, at Lake Charles, but instead at Oregon Ironworks, right, obviously in, in, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and, and 59 of the 72 submodules are still going to be made at, at Lake Charles, but um. You know, what we do see is that even when Oregon Ironworks takes over CA-20 fabrication all the way back in uh, 2014, right? So this is years after construction has started. We see that they that Westinghouse issues a thousand engineering and design change requests to Oregon Ironworks just on those 13 submodules of the 72 submodules that, that, that CA-20 uh, consists of. Right. And this is once again in 2014. And we see that, you know, we have um, of the 13 of 72 submodules, every one of them is late as a result of this. Right. Um, And even by 2014, and these are all on the critical path. Right. You You can't build the plan. Right. Without these modules. So essentially what's going on here is the construction teams, in some cases, are kind of waiting around for these modules to arrive. And we start starting the entire critical path of the project 
sort of just completely collapse uh, but, uh, in front of everyone, right? Um, and, you know, of the, um, you know, at Lake Charles, right, uh, of the 59 of the 72 submodules, right, when we just start looking at, you know, mid-construction back in 2014, right, we were supposed to already have CA-20 on hook, right, by this point, but they had only received 25 of the 59 submodules they needed to assemble CA-20, right? And 24 of those were late or way behind where the construction was. So we're, we're starting to see this module supply chain caused in many part ways by the, um, you know, lack of design maturity start rippling through the project and just destroying the critical path. There's one more thing that I think we we really need to talk about here uh, before we move on to some of the other challenges, which was Lake Charles. You know, I hear this actually a lot, even in the nuclear industry today, that you know the oil and gas industry uh, they fabricate stuff all the time, right? And they do, right? At very very high pressures, right? Uh, very very complex uh, piping and mechanical and electrical and INC. Um, and in some ways, you know, the oil and gas industry, regardless of what you think about it uh, from a climate perspective, it's an amazing collection of suppliers, of engineers, of technicians, of craft laborers, all working together to optimize and, and, and sort of build uh, a, a oil and, and hydrocarbon supply chain that is, you know, continuously producing more and more. And we, there's often this talk about, well, if only we could translate that ethos to nuclear. And I keep on saying, well, we actually tried doing this at Lake Charles, right? Yeah, Shaw's yeah. entire, Lake Charles, Louisiana, of course, is one of the uh, one of the centers of the U.S. hydrocarbon industry. Right? It's on the Gulf, right? We have a huge amount of natural gas and petroleum going on. There's a whole industrial ecosystem down there that is amazing at, at doing these things. But it turned out that actually the, the issues with nuclear safety culture really became uh, a major challenge at that facility and in many cases doomed it. And I want to be clear, this is not just the Nuclear Regulatory Commission sort of coming in and saying your safety culture isn't right. This was inside the actual contractors, right? So even though Shaw is the main EPC, we also see that it's like Shaw's brother, Shaw uh, Modular Solutions, that's fabricating it. And it's like Shaw Nuclear that is handling the procurement. So it's not an arm's length stuff. But in a famous incident, one of the quality insure pe assurance people from the EPC shop at Shaw goes down to Lake Charles, starts inspecting it, and says, your quality assurance is shit. Right? That you you literally are not follow. you know, people are fabricating the welding logs, Right, that that the welds are not at nuclear grade uh, at all. We're gonna have to redo all them. And to give you an idea of what the safety culture was, this wasn't just you know a pedantic NRC inspector. the The person who works at Shaw, who then says, "I'm gonna have to order a work stoppage, right, until you can get basically the safety culture up to where it needs to be." He gets uh, a letter opener thrown at him. Right. Uh, and the the foremans of the plant literally start thrashing chairs around and, um, you know, throwing papers and folders uh, around in the midst of this. And this is not the NRC. Once again, this is literally the actual sister division of this company that is making these modules. So, you know, that's a pretty violent and, and, and kind of almost something. No one got hurt, thankfully. But but uh, kind of funny story. But that really does show, I think, a very big difference in, in a nuclear uh, sort of safety culture and engineering culture, you know, um, you know, sort of stopping, you know, having dissenting views is not only supposed to be tolerated, it yeah. is supposed to be encouraged. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And what we just saw is that there was a very large break in the ability of the oil and gas industry to be able to just seamlessly translate into the uh, sort of nuclear supply chain. And I think that's a, a really important lesson that we should all be taking, that, it's, it, that nuclear construction is very different um, and that it's not just going to be the NRC, it's going to be your customers and your ultimate, you know, that are going to basically demand that you're, you're meeting up to the standard that you need. Okay, I want to get into um, like EPC structure and how that changed, Westinghouse bankruptcy, 
uh, I think moving finally over to getting Bechtel to sort of take over. I need you to explain to me and also my listeners what EPC models actually are, who is the EPC, et cetera. Uh, but but just just to take a moment to just uh, you know process what you've just said, like I can only imagine how demoralizing it must have been for those people throwing the the papers up in the air and screaming. Like I could I could see myself doing that. It'd be so incredibly frustrating. You've you've done all this work. Maybe it's jackhammering up concrete because the rebar wasn't laid properly. It's at these module factors where they're supposed to click together, but they're four inches off in terms of their specs or something like that. Having to go back and do things from scratch, like that would drive me bonkers. Um, anyway, I just just had to bookmark that for a second because uh, you hear, you know, and, and again, uh, heard a number of these stories. Um, it, it just must have been incredibly frustrating. Well, I think what's going on there is, is that you're trying... Um, to build something when you know build something where the fabrication as we just noted it's not just regular fabrication right uh, for better or for worse you know we have very strict quality assurance quality in the nuclear industry now i would argue that's part of the reason why we're so reliable we're so safe maybe there, there's a discussion that we should be having about how we're going to change app b and and and, and nqa1 but regardless that is what we need for this build they didn't if they wanted to have that argument you don't do that mid construction right this was what they needed to do and so this is very challenging manufacturing and fabrication this is not you know simple stuff by any stretch of the imagination i want to give the respect to the workers that and the, uh, to see the challenges but in addition to all of that here they have Westinghouse and their designers coming down and giving hundreds of design changes as they're trying to build this thing. And so the frustration of this guy, uh, of, of, these, of the plant foreman, is understandable in some ways. Um, however, it really does show, I think, and this leads directly to your point, that we didn't have the sort of integrated project delivery framework that we needed of sort of one team, one mission. Right uh, between the EPC, the sub suppliers, uh, and and Westinghouse and the utilities, right? And we see, you know, I think the most initial thing that we see is we obviously are seeing that the customer, you know, the utility in this case, is being left out of the conversation in a lot of ways. That Westinghouse is not being um, very frank to them, and neither is CBNI. I think part of the reason is is that these were initially set up as somewhat of fixed price contracts believe it or not. Um, and a lot of people talk about fixed price contracting as the way forward in nuclear. I think that anyone who thinks that, uh, so what a fixed price contract is, is that the EPC and the nuclear island, the nuclear steam supply system vendor, right, they're going to basically build the plant come hell or high water for a fixed price. Now there's in terms of hell or high water happened here, but, but, you know, um, the, and the idea is, is that, you know, from the customer side, you know, the EPC and the nuclear vendor are taking on all of the risks. Now, what is, you asked your question, what is an EPC? Uh, so it's engineering, procurement, and construction, right? So these are firms like Bechtel, Floor, uh, what was Shaw was the EPC here, Stone and Webster was the old ones. And, and is that engineering the engineering EPC for project. the overall project or each sub project has an EPC? I'm just trying to understand, like, you got the utility who's the buyer, I guess, an owner and operator. Um, they are, they're going to Westinghouse, which is the vendor. We like your design. Uh, but if, you, yeah, if you can just explain that ecosystem a bit better, because yeah, it's so still. Nuclear pro projects are weird, right? Um, you know, you'll go to Westinghouse and Westinghouse will say, I will provide a nuclear island for you. And there's going to be some specification, but I'm not going to touch the turbine building. Right. And, you know, a nuclear island or a turbine building is is sort of and it's not just the turbine building. You know, it makes a lot of steam, but I, I don't know what you're going to really do with with that steam flow. Um, so what you do is you bring in an EPC firm. Uh, this was historically called in, in the U.S. nuclear industry before the 90s, architects and engineering firms, A&Es, right? And the A&Es would, uh, would do some level of the NSSS integration, right? They would actually design the plant, maybe even design some of the aspects of the containment building and some of the safety features, right? You actually see variation in the U.S. Uh, sort of nuclear fleet as a result of this. Um, they would build like the emergency diesel generator system, some of the, you know, class one E power systems, uh, and they would be responsible. There'd also be a construction firm that would be responsible for constructing all of this, for providing the laborers, providing the skilled labor, manual labor, et cetera. Right. Cause obviously Westinghouse does not have an army of construction workers ready to be deployed. In addition to, to that, um, as I noted earlier, they, the nuclear vendor, uh, GE, Westinghouse, Combustion, Babcocks, 
they won't build the turbine built in. They won't build the condenser system, right? They won't build the you know purified water system. They won't build the circulating water infrastructure. So you have the architect and engineer or the AP, EPC that builds what we call the balance of plant, which as its name implies is sort of you've got the nuclear island and then you have the BOP, right? And the BOP architecture uh, can vary very significantly, even if you're the same exact nuclear island. Um, so we see huge heterogeneity, um, as we've talked about, on, I think the first episode I was ever on, not only do you have the nuclear island itself varying from these different manufacturers, but then you have actually the secondary side of the plant, the sort of power conversion, circulating water, etc., being designed by, a, a, you know, half a dozen, in the case of, of the U.S. nuclear fleet, different architect and engineering firms. And then in the old way that you would do it, you may have a different construction firm that then is constructing the uh, architect and engineering of, a, of this third party. So you have many different players here right, that are coming together in a consortium to sort of deliver the project. And this is the problem, I would argue, in the nuclear sector right now is that we have projects, not products. Right. You can't just go to Westinghouse and say, Westinghouse, I want to buy an AP1000. But Westinghouse will say, well, I, I will provide this and I'll provide procurement relationships for my scope. But you're going to need an EPC firm to do your scope. And then you're going to have to manage all of these guys together to make sure everyone's playing nicely and everything is working together, um, which is a major managerial task. Now, I should note that not always... Did we use an external EPC? There are cases. Tennessee Valley Authority was famous for this, but PSENG in New Jersey, right? Niagara Mohawk. Uh, you see, sometimes the utilities themselves, especially early on in this in this the nuclear buildup, would actually do the EPC role. Sometimes they had enough of an architecture and engineering staff themselves, and they would like to build their turbine island the way TVA builds turbine islands. So you see in TVA, right, it might be GE or Westinghouse as the NSSS vendor, but it's literally Tennessee Valley Authority that is designing their own balance of plant, designing sort of those nuclear safety features that are not in the scope of, of the nuclear steam supply system vendor or ancillary systems on the nuclear island, and, and also building the construction and managing that. But that's not the arrangement that was done on the AP-1000. Instead, yeah, sorry. I mean, this is probably too uh, general of a question. Um, but, you know, these large utilities like the Tennessee Valley Authority or Ontario Hydro, which uh, people joked it was a sure. construction company, not so much utility because of, you know, these big four, eight unit can do plants that we built all over the place. Um, but one would think that that might, you know, I have a bias, I guess, towards vertical integration and some some degree of planning. Um, is there any sort of tendency for that to, to work out better, be more economical, or there's just too many variables to throw in there to isolate that as, as something which is favorable or desirable? So um, it turns out that I have heard really mixed reviews of this. I, I was talking to a guy at, um, at Hope Creep at Hope Creek and Salem, right. Was talking about, you know, the, the challenges, for example, that we had with the condenser design, that was utilized for the balance of plant. And it was a condenser design that had been used on every single other PSEG uh, fossil plant, but was just completely incompatible with uh, sort of nuclear construction. Um, I'm not so sure that it's clear that using an internal versus an external A&E architect and engineer uh, has a clear signal in the data. Um, what it does have a clear signal right. in the data, however, is the ability of an informed customer, uh, in this case the utility, to have the internal management staff uh, and engineering staff to be able to walk, watch like a hawk, right, um, the EPCs and the vendors, right? And to make sure that actually when they say, well, 88% or 95% of the designs are issued for, uh, of the of the work packages are issued for construction, that there's someone who's able to go in and say, okay, well, show me them. And let me let me walk yeah. through and do a sample yeah. of it and actually have the, the competency to be able to evaluate um, what the EPC and or A and E and the and the vendor is giving you. Um, I think this was a ma is a major challenge in the US model of nuclear deployment. Now, in other countries, like in France, for example, EDF, which is the utility and the ultimate um, sort of operator of the plant, they just manage the construction completely. And in fact, EDF was so integrated that it, before the 90s, France didn't have a nuclear regulator. EDF itself would just regulate the construction because they're the state anyway. They do the architecture and engineering and the and they would work with Framatome who would do the reactor internals, but they would do everything else, right? 
And that sort of approach, and that led to this like 22, you know, I might get the exact number wrong, of the CPY, CP1, CP012 sort of deployment of those 900 megawatt electrical, you know, they just kind of, you know, printed them out um, and, and identically. So I, I would argue that we have made a mistake here in some ways with this sort of constellation of architects and engineers, right? You know, there, there were six a and E's, seven a and E's that were building a large number of nuclear plants in the heyday of our fleet deployment. You know, Stone and Webster, Abasco, Bechtel, Burns and Rowe, Sargent and Lundy. I'm probably missing one or two here somewhere. Um, but, you know, that, that sort of led to this non-standardized approach. And it's, it's a very hard thing from a management perspective to manage. And that becomes a critical factor, as we'll start seeing. So we have... Oh, we're going quite in heart. detail here. I, I, yeah, this, I, I'm this realizing... Is, is this... Yeah. yeah. This is good. This is good. We is have it, eight minutes okay. uh, and a hard stop. It's a hard stop. And I, I have a feeling there's kind of a part two happening here. Yeah, there has to be a part two. Because we haven't even got... We're in 2014 right now. Yeah. So we have years do you, more. <laughs> do, do we do we wrap do we wrap up now? Do you have a flowery finish? Do you want to introduce what we're going to talk about in our in our follow up episode? How do, so, you, how do you want to use? So this? as I'm I, I'm I want to start saying, right, you know, as I'm sort of le- I'm sort of foreshadowing. This project is not going very very well. Yes, sir. Uh, neither one of these projects are going well, and the project participants start suing each other. And we started to see even before this initial lawsuits or initial threats of litigation happening from the suppliers going back to Westinghouse saying we can't make our uh, you know contracted scheduled delivery date and that's not our fault it's your fault right, and right. we shouldn't be held liable for that and then Westinghouse saying well you weren't even ready you know you had all these quality assurance quality control issues so that both were probably true but basically this entire project starts breaking down and what we're going to start seeing is that the engine the EPC firms really start exiting out. And they're basically saying, hey, I want out, quit. One of the things that happens first is that Shaw gets bought by Chicago Bridge and Iron, right, which is a very, very big uh, you know, procurer and engineering firm. And Chicago Bridge and Iron is looking at this thing and saying, this is a trash heap. And I'm, uh, I'm liable for a huge amount of what needs to go right. And this project is not going right. So Chicago Bridge and Iron basically tries tries to get out and does get out and transfers back responsibility actually to Westinghouse itself. And then Westinghouse itself tries for a couple of months to manage the EPC role. And they transfer the Shaw and the Stone and Webster division out of Shaw, out of CB&I and into, uh, into Westinghouse, where it still lives, by the way. And Westinghouse tries to manage the project at all. And that doesn't go so well either. And start, we start seeing a rapid changeover of EPCs until we stabilize on, on one other one. But we're going to see that one of these projects, anyway, I'm giving too much, but suffice it to say the drama is only going to increase. The problem, though, that I think that probably the listeners are realizing is there's a lot that went wrong in this project. And almost one or two podcast episodes are not sufficient, I think, to uh, explain the full depth uh, of this, of the failures here. And, and yet, and but, yet this is so vitally worth understanding to inform us oh, again, of course. as we are on the verge, as I was kind of introducing the episode of a, of a new, people won't say Renaissance because they were stunk so badly, but of a new revival in which I would argue we're in a much worse place than they were in the noughties. The price of natural gas is still quite low. There's talk. Uh, some of the impulse to do nuclear is climate driven, which is wonderful, but I think not pragmatic enough of a driver to force us into doing something as difficult as nuclear with such a high value proposition, but with such a hard bar to entry and so many challenges to getting it right. Um, so just, uh, I, I think that's a good place to leave it. But, you know, we went into a lot of depth, a lot of detail. We might have lost some people in acronyms. We'll try and make up for that with the show notes. Oh, but, sorry about that. <laughs> but it's, it's I, I, this is, I think, very much worth doing. Um, just, just as a couple of teasers, um, maybe a little trivia with you quickly, James. Um, is the Vogel, the two reactors of Vogel, will that be the most expensive power plant or the most expensive building ever built? I've heard if you were to build the pyramids today, it would cost you about eight or nine billion dollars. For reference, Vogel, I think we're at 35 billion. And then there was, uh, God, uh, Toshiba had to pay like 3.7 billion to get out of some kind of commitment of getting them done on I think, time. I think the 35 price. includes the couple billion bucks that Toshiba put in, but um, it's a lot of money. It probably it is the most expensive power plant that has ever been built. Um, 
I don't know what the most expensive building is, uh, so I'm not going to comment on that. Um, yeah, it, it, we should not underestimate. It is not anti-nuclear propaganda to look at what happened at Vogel and say, you know, uh, <laughs> do we really want to do this again? Yeah. Um, what I will say about this is the ratepayers of Georgia, we should be eternally grateful, thankful to them. And the ratepayers of South Carolina, who gave them the worst deal in some ways, they paid for all of these lessons. We shouldn't have made them pay for these lessons. It's something that the industry, in some ways, in my mind, owes an apology to these people. But the flip side, the greatest sin that we could do right now, those were paid for with not only their, their money, but also with just incredible perseverance by a lot of these workers who ended up finishing this plant and a lot of the engineers and a lot of the corporate officials within Westinghouse, within the EPC firms who could have thrown in the towel, but they didn't say, we're, we're, they said, we're going to finish what we started. And the greatest shame that could happen now is that those incredibly expensive, incredibly valuable lessons that we generated, if it doesn't do anything, if we just leave it on the floor. The whole point is, is that we started down the learning curve and we set our, the bar pretty low for what the next one can do. But we have immense, immense um, lessons learned that we got from this. And my whole point is right now, the, we have those lessons and we have those lessons unlike any other power plant that um, uh, uh, nuclear steam supply system technology in the West, I mean, besides the EPR, but no, no one should ever want to build one of those. Um, but uh, sorry about that shade. But like, um, you know, the basic point is, is we need to figure out where, where the innovation and where the technology and where the entrepreneurial spirit needs to go is figuring out how to deploy and capitalize and, and deploy those lessons. And I don't like this thing of us saying we're, you know, that was hard. Let's start something completely new. That industrial ADHD, we got to end. We got to take some industrial Adderall and focus on the, you know, the sort of lessons that we learned here. And that's the bright side of the story. That's the good side of the story. We got through, we have those lessons. It's the most exciting. And that's why I'm more bullish on nuclear now in some ways than I would have been in 2005 from a deploy, deployment standpoint, because we've, we've gone through this process once and we've gone, and right, most right. of these challenges can't happen again, right? You can't not have a complete design because we have a complete design and you can literally walk into the building and it's fissioning atoms and making power. Okay. Um, I mean, just just uh, just in closing, and I, I won't ask for a long commentary for on this, but it, it is interesting. You said we have to lean in this. The people of Georgia are owed an apology. I think there's a lot of defensiveness in the advocacy community. Um, I've, I've found myself, like, I think I would be the, one of the most incredible anti-nuclear activists because I really understand a lot after this five-year journey. I have no intention to become that. But that being said, it's not it's not being an anti-nuclear activist to actually acknowledge the problems and the challenges and to acknowledge some of the good arguments of your opponents. It actually makes you more effective. You come across as less of a zealot. So that's just one little commentary. The other would be, I mean, we're starting to hear like, well, you know, the Lazard with firming costs that were updated recently. Like if, if you're adding solar to the most insane duck curve in California, you're starting to have power prices that are similar to what Vogel produces. The, the the wind farms that are kind of going under off the shore, I believe, New Jersey, the PPAs that are being thrown about there are, are cost competitive, shall we say, with the world's most expensive power plant. This is not to say that we shouldn't do better. We can't do better. But it, and it's not to make excuses, but but it is interesting in terms of taking this this project and this debacle into uh, into the broader consequences of, of where we're at right now. You stole my 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 ending. Uh, um you know, lines for the second episode, but you, you, you hit it right on the nail. The first thing, just to go from the, from the end as, to start, you know, as expensive as we ended up getting, which, you know, power is going to be a hundred seventy, hundred seventy five dollars a megawatt hour. We are signing, I'm in New York state as ever, well, as people know, uh, we are signing power procurement agreements right now on the order of 140, $150 a megawatt hour for offshore wind, which, you know, has a lot less value as power simply because it is intermittent. Ultimately, it does need some sort of farming resource on it. Um, and those are, and as you know, a lot of the offshore wind providers are walking away right now from, um, from those power purchase agreements because they can't build it at that price. So I don't think that even at this price, it, it, it unfortunately, uh, 
it looks that insane compared to where we are today. However, right, we should not be aiming to be deploying power at 170 or $175 a megawatt hour. And certainly, if we are, we should be upfront about that it's going to be in that scale of the price. Which brings me back to the first point that I brought up, right, the apology. I know that I, I don't know. One of the things that, you know, forget about the nuclear safety discussion. One of the things that the financing of a large capital project like this requires, whether it's the taxpayers, whether it's the rate payers, it does require a certain sort of social contract. It's that ultimately we're putting people's pocketbooks on the line, right, uh, to build our project. And we need to be able to do that, by the way. Uh, that, that just is the way that these large capital projects work in a civilization. But the, so, the, the other side of that social contract is, is the responsibility to use that money responsibly and to be ready to build the project that you're building. And I don't think it is a bad thing for us to say, you know, we screwed up here um, and we won't do it again. And we're here to explain to you what we did wrong and why it won't happen again. And the corollary to that is not only is that, I think, good PR, good optics, I think it's also essential for us to really learn the lessons that happened there so that we actually don't repeat them and so that we can actually improve on them. Um, that's not just apologies. That's actually good engineering and that's good science. Okay. Well, this episode, we've spent a lot of time in the noughties. Um, I think painting the context, um, giving some great, uh, uh, context again from the Chinese builds doing our case controlled study. I'm sure we'll, we'll reference that a little bit more, but I think this was very useful. Um, I guess we'll move into the teens, uh, from our noughties into our teens, um, and talk uh, a lot more specifically about Vogel. We didn't talk much about summer. Um, but I think this is a fascinating kind of origin story, um, for the AP 1000 for lessons learned. James, thank you for coming back and we will have you back shortly while the iron is hot, um, to, uh, to finish this conversation. Great. Thank you, Chris.